Hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 70 of the Camino Voice. Today I speak with the organizer of the Camino Commons tree celebration. Please welcome Emily Harmon Waterloo. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice podcast, where I interview folks around Camino Island and beyond. If you want to stay up to date on events, businesses, and even hear a little history of this area, subscribe to this podcast and share with your friends. Thanks for listening. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. On this episode, I got to speak with Emily Harmon Waterloo, who is a new member of the uh, Marketplace team here on Camino Island. Um, and she is actually the one who's been organizing the uh, Camino Commons tree celebration that we are planning on doing this year um, once again. So I know there's probably going to be a lot of questions of how are we planning on doing this, keeping it safe, if anyone out there has been to our old tree lightings. Um, Obviously, there was a lot of people. Social distancing wasn't even a thing back then. Um, so we really wanted to take some time to talk about what precautions are we taking to make sure that this is a safe and fun event for everyone involved. Um, but on top of that, I wanted you guys to get um, introduced to Emily because she's going to be here at the Marketplace and you'll be seeing her. Um, so she, And she's going to be organizing more and more events as we continue on. So at least events as we are able to. So... Anyways, I wanted to introduce you to her, um, but also just wanted to get a platform to be able to talk to you about the safety, um, the, the precautions we're putting in place for the tree lighting. So um, really quickly, we will be um, requiring reservations for the tree lighting, um, unlike last year. Um, so I do want to, I want to throw that out there now. Um, so you can actually uh, make your reservation now uh, at CaminoCommons.com slash events and click on the uh, reserve your spot. So anyways... Um, but we'll get into all of that and more in our conversation. So please, without further ado, enjoy my conversation with Emily Harmon Waterloo. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice. Today, I'm here with the assistant to the regional manager of Camino Commons. Welcome to the podcast, Emily Harmon Waterloo. Hello. Thank you for having me. Um, so before we get started, tell us a little bit about Emily. Well, I have been here at Camino Commons for about a month. Um, before that, I was um, living in Mount Vernon, got my degree in um, Newburgh, Oregon, just outside of Portland, and spent some time there in wine country in the Willamette Valley. Um, and then I spent some time in the theater industry there. And most recently, I was living in London for a while. Nice. Very cool. So you said you grew up in this area. Um, what was it like? Uh, what what part of this area did you grow up in? Yeah, so for the most part, I grew up in Mount Vernon, but okay. before that, spent some time living in Wenatchee on the east side, and then also lived on Orcas Island. Um, very young, lived there for a few years, and I was actually born in Port Angeles, so a little bit all <laughs> over the state. Okay, cool. Yeah, I don't think I knew that you did, were all over the place. Yeah, a little bit of bouncing around and experiencing different places. Got it. Very cool. Um, and then, uh, so did you go to, were you homeschooled or go to high school? Yeah, I was homeschooled all the way through. Um, I went to a Montessori preschool, but other than that, I was homeschooled from kindergarten all the way up through high school. Okay. Um, yeah. Nice. Um, and then where, where'd you do, where'd you go after that? After that, when I graduated high school, I went <clears throat> to university at George Fox University in Newburgh, Oregon, and I was there for four years um, studying theater and Spanish. Uh, so through that, I got to be involved in all of the theater productions, and then through the Spanish degree, I actually got to spend a semester living in Spain um, to fulfill that degree. So I got to travel a little bit during that time, too. Nice. And so, uh, George Fox, what was your major that you were going into? Um, so, theater and Spanish double major. Okay. Um, so, the theater degree was encompassing several different things, but I was on more of the production side. So, I did stage management um, and took all of the design classes as well, um, but then also did some acting classes along with that to kind of understand both sides of the spectrum, I would okay. say. Um, and then Spanish 
was a lot of uh, literature and history and language. And then again, um, for that degree, you were required to study abroad somewhere. Um, and I had always wanted to study or at least visit Spain. So that was kind of the perfect opportunity. Nice. How was it uh, your semester over there then? It was amazing. Yeah, I absolutely loved it. Um, we were a small university kind of um, set up for students from the States, from a few different universities here, and all went over together. Um, just absolutely loved getting to live in another country. I'd never done that before. So it was a new experience that way um, and just fell in love with the culture and the language and traveling in that area. So we got to travel a little bit within the country and then a few countries around it, but um, definitely want to go back. Nice. Very cool. Um, and then with the theater, what, what had kind of got you interested in theater and, and why stage management versus acting or kind of all the different aspects of theater? Yeah, so I started in theater when I was uh, living in Mount Vernon. When I was younger, I um, got involved in theater through some homeschool groups, and um, they would have theater classes and then went to community theater, so worked with Meta Performing Arts and TAG, um, both as an actor, and then um, did a little bit of assistant to the director or um, stage management, and also did a lot of acting through my church. We had a great program for that. Um, so kind of some weekly um, things for students and then holidays. So Christmas and Easter, we would usually have theater programs. And then from that and from the experience of getting to assist a director and be on that side of the of the seats or the stage, however you like to say it, um, I really got interested in that aspect of getting to be involved with various aspects. So learning what all of the designers are doing while assisting the actors or being there and available for them. And so started doing more and more of that in college um, and realized that that's really what I prefer um, and where my passion is for that. Okay. Very cool. So then, um, then you graduated from George Fox. Uh, what did you do after that? After George Fox, I moved to the East Coast, actually, and was a live-in au pair for 18 months um, for a family with five children, which was a fantastic experience. Um, I actually just spent most of quarantine with them. Um, so really enjoyed that, learned a lot, got to be in a new um, beautiful place. Um, got to learn how to make maple syrup, which was an exciting skill that nice. I never thought I was looking for, but was really great. Um, and again, was there for about 18 months. And then after that, moved back to Newburgh and started working for um, an inn and spa in the Willamette Valley. So as the part of the concierge and front desk team, and was there for a couple of years learning about wine country, learning about vineyards, um, and the hospitality industry in general. Mm -hmm. And that was my first kind of dipping my toe into that, which um, I really, really liked and mm -hmm. really liked the opportunity to welcome people to a place that I lived and that I knew well and kind of help them understand it and enjoy it, which was really exciting. Yeah. Yeah, I actually got to interview um, Will Slickers, who is in the hospitality business as well. And he's actually working with a lot of um, some actually some pretty big hotels and stuff like that. But really trying to like um, bring that because that as an industry, like the, the house hospitality, stuff like that, like that's obviously been around for such a long time. And in so many ways, it's really been done the same way for so many years. Like things mm -hmm. don't really make massive jumps and leaps in that. Um, but with COVID and everything that's going on, like, um, he's been working with a, a group of other people. And like I said, with other large hotels as well in really changing that industry and trying to get it up to speed with where it's at now, um, because it's kind of a slow moving industry and stuff, things don't change very quickly. Um, having some younger entrepreneurial type people in there that are really like trying to figure out what's the best way to use technology that we currently have available, um, to um, to change the hospitality industry. Mm -hmm. um, That's really exciting. So. And like you say, it's hard to move quickly in that industry in that, you know, people are planning yeah. so far ahead um, in either the building of new venues or in their own travel. And so you really need to kind of gradually integrate things and change things. So mm -hmm. that's exciting, though. Yeah. So it was, it was really fun listening to him. And, and um, it was one of those things that that was not his 
career path of choice. He was trying to do some other things on the side, um, but ended up landing a job at the uh, the uh, Davenport uh, in Spokane and just really enjoyed working in the high-end hospitality side of just serving customers, kind of like you were saying, just introducing people to the area and really just getting to show them the best of what they had to offer there. Mm -hmm. um, and then he realized, like, after a while, like, he was trying to do these other ventures and things and realized, wait, I actually enjoy my job more than these other ventures I'm trying to get <laughs> right, started. Exactly. So, yeah. So, um, but you said you were in the Willamette, bleh, the, va the valley that you were in. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, you said it was the wine country. And we've been in the marketplace. I know we've been working to try and get uh, our wine up and going and everything. But what was it in, in that area? How did you get to learn about wine and stuff like that during that time? Yeah, during that time, um, I started there as a reservationist, so essentially taking reservations for people. And then I moved to the front desk and quickly discovered that people had questions that I didn't have answers to, um, like what was my favorite vineyard to go to and what was my favorite wine and why? And so I figured I should figure out the answer to those um, and started wine tasting, which I'd never done before. I'd tried some wine and enjoyed wine somewhat, but I'd never gone tasting or really dove into that much. Um, and so that opportunity really opened up kind of that whole world for me because as I was going to visit those vineyards um, and those wineries, they would um, give me kind of extra information or background information that they knew would be useful to our guests. And so I kind of got to see kind of behind the curtain, I guess, so to speak, a little bit. And um, it's just fascinating to mm -hmm. learn how the industry mm -hmm. works. You know, I know that there's a whole industry there, but then actually learning the nuts and bolts of what goes into it and seeing a vineyard and walking through a vineyard for the first time um, was really, really fun. And so that kind of hit me off on, on getting excited about that and meeting people that own the wineries and the vineyards um, and seeing their process. And then that kind of spurred me to move on to the concierge position, which is um, much more um, planning itineraries for people and helping them match the right winery and vineyard with what they're looking for or what they're interested oh, in. Oh, okay. Um, so it was a lot more tailor-made to each guest, um, but again, needing to know more of the background. So um, getting to be out and experience that was really, really fun, and I really enjoyed it. I do miss that about being there. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's exciting that the market places starting to dive into that too yeah very cool um and so while you were working there were you still in the theater world while you were at the hotel or what else was going on then yeah I was I was definitely trying to do both so several friends of mine from university had started a small theater company and uh in the same town in Newburgh and so I would uh stage manage their things or work with them um kind of on the nuts and bolts of the company on the weekends and evenings when I wasn't at the hotel and uh, that was a volunteer position you know we were all just kind of trying to make something happen and then after a couple of years years, I was hired at a local theater company to work in their box office part-time, which quickly moved to a full-time position that they offered me. And so at that point, I transitioned from the hotel to the theater full-time and then worked there for a few years um, as their group sales manager in their box office. So working with groups of students or um, groups of individuals that wanted to attend a show and help them get that planned and set up and then um, moved from that into a little bit of stage management there as well. Okay. So you, you were, <clears throat> you started with the group sales, but then you were, what level were you able to work into with the stage management after a while? Yeah, I was able to assistant stage manage a few shows. Um, and that was a great opportunity. And I would do that again, evenings and weekends. And then during the day, Monday through Friday, I would be in the office. Um, so again, kind of seeing different facets of the company. And then I was um, contracted to assistant stage manage and then stage manage a show um, this past summer and fall. But it, COVID uh, sort of changed those plans a little bit. And uh, the theater, as most theaters are, um, has been closed since then. So hopefully I'll have the opportunity to work with them at some point in the future. Mm -hmm. Nice. Um, and then you said uh, you were you lived in uh, London for a while. What, what kind of drew you over there then? 
After I had been working at the theater for a few years, I knew I wanted to kind of expand my theater skills or arts and business skills. And so I started looking at master's degrees and I found um, the perfect fit for me, it turns out, which was in London at King's College London. And my master's degree is in arts and cultural management. And that was a one year degree. And then I added on a few months so that I could stay out my visa and enjoy London. Um, So that's what I was doing most recently. And that degree um, kind of encompassed a lot of the business and art um, kind of where they meet and the juxtaposition of those as well. Um, And then also had an international aspect because London is such an international city. We had students from all over the world and all over the disciplines of the arts. So we had uh, dancers and theater professionals and museum curators and all uh, different facets of the arts all kind of coming together to learn how together as the arts industry, um, we work and relate and work internationally, um, as well. Okay. Nice. Um, very cool. What was your uh, favorite part of being living in London and, and doing, attending school there? Um, the best part of school was that I just, I missed school, honestly. Um, I really, (laughs) I'm just one of those people, um, maybe not missing the homework side of it, but I really like attending classes and kind of being shown the things that I don't know and getting to explore that. And then living in London is just amazing being able to walk out your door and hop on a train and go pretty much anywhere, um, you know, in the country or walk downtown and go see any show you wanted to see on any given day. You know, um, there were countless Tuesday nights that I just felt like I want to go see a performance and I would walk down the street and get a ticket for a show that had incredible actors and dancers and singers. And, um, you know, it was just astounding. And, and of course also the history, just walking around town and, walking by St. Paul's Cathedral and Parliament and Buckingham Palace just in your normal walk. It was not normal to me, but (laughs) very exciting. Very cool. Um, Okay, and then from there, you you came back here. um, And is that where... Did you actually come all the way back to the West Coast and then East Coast, or what was that? Um, Yeah, I definitely came all the way back to the West Coast, celebrated Christmas with my family, and um, did one show at the theater company um, in Oregon for January and February, and then went for what was supposed to be a three-week visit in Vermont and turned into a seven-month visit. (laughs) <laughs> and, um, yeah, buying, you know, summer clothes online because I had all of my winter clothes and, um, you know, lots of unexpected things, but, um, lots of fun was definitely had. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Um, and then you came back here, um, and <laughs> as I alluded to it in the beginning, uh, started up here at the marketplace, um, and talk a bit, little bit of just, I don't know if you can, but the best you can of what you do and kind of your, your position here. Mm -hmm. So at the marketplace, I'm doing some work um, in the gift shop, uh, just kind of front facing and and being available and meeting customers. And then I'm also doing some basic scheduling and day-to-day kind of admin tasks. And then I'm also working on a little bit of the event planning. So the holiday tree celebration, and then um, also the holiday market that's coming up, and also working about integrating the wine into the company. So getting to go back and visit some vineyards and curate that and sort of start exploring that. Nice. Yes. And that's worked out great for me because it's taken a lot off my plate. Um, <laughs> although it seems like as soon as you move something off the plate, someone else puts something on the plate and of then course. there's more. <laughs> as soon as there's space, it will be occupied, I think. Yes. Um, awesome. So I part of the reason I wanted to do this podcast was I wanted to get you on um, and introduce you to a lot of the people that are here on the island. Um, and then also want to talk about the Christmas tree light celebration that we have coming up here on December 12th at 4.30. So, um, you know, we were we were in this position where we really didn't think it was going to be possible to even have a tree lighting. Um, and we were actually talking with um, Lydia Crouch, who was on a previous podcast. Um, and she was like, I just had this idea. Like, what if we did something crazy out there and like spaced everyone out? 
And um, and I was like, no, I don't think we can have that many people together. Um, but uh, she was persistent on that. And so we started talking. And um, so anyways, what I kind of wanted to explain the whole story from start to finish of why we <laughs> have the, you know, the gall to try and do a Christmas tree lighting in the middle of COVID. Um, but just kind of talk about like the steps, what we're doing, what we've done, what we're doing and, and, and why we think that we can do this safely. Mm-hmm. Um, so like you say, it started with sort of the idea was, is it okay? Can we do something like that? Really wanting to be able to provide something for the community, but also wanting to keep the community safe and keeping that balance constantly. So um, from your talks with Lydia and then our talks together, um, just sort of brainstorming, is this possible? Then speaking with Commissioner St. Clair and also a health official, to see if this would be um, reasonable to to start planning and um, hearing from both of them that uh, as long as we were taking the precautions we were taking and being as careful as we could, that that sounded like... Um, like it was something that we could continue to pursue. So then going from there, we sort of started developing what the the footprint would look like and measuring um, out in the grass, kind of seeing what that would be like. So we determined that circles would be the best that are about six feet across and then six feet apart from each other and determining that each of those would fit about six people that are within the same household. So making sure that we're maintaining that um household um, sticking together and keeping those differentiated is really important to that. Um, Also, even though it is going to be outside, we did determine that masks should be worn by everyone for the duration of the program. And uh, just, again, for the safety of everyone to... um, to keep everyone as safe and then also as at ease as possible during that time. And uh, there will be uh, reservations for those circles so that we know who's arriving and how many people will be arriving so that both for each individual circle and then also for the whole space, we're maintaining a smaller number of people than we would normally have. And of course, then during check-in, And as people are in line for that, um, being aware of social distancing between family units and between um, house units, and we'll have staff available to to help with that and to kind of um, help direct everyone to where they should be going so that it's not sort of a a smash up of people, but everyone sort of has (laughs) a more direct route of where they're going. so that we can still still do this, but again, still keep everyone safe. Um, and we are offering the option of Facebook Live uh, if anyone wants to participate but is not able to, um, for whatever reason, either come down or not able to wear a mask. We do have that option as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and then what, what else are we going to be doing, um, I guess, for the event? Normally, uh, the event is kind of a... Um, there's like a lot going on. We've got things going on at library and a marketplace and all this different stuff. And obviously we can't do it the same way this year. Um, what are kind of some of the things that we're going to be adding on to this that we, you know, think we can actually fit in this? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, we are asking when people make reservations to know how many children will be joining them. Um, and we're going to have a giveaway, um, for each of them, a bag that they can take home. Um, so again, since they can't, like you say, participate with all of the businesses, um, in the library in the area, but we're working with the library and other businesses to have, um, something special that each of the kids can take home with them, um, so that they can keep enjoying it and, and yeah, have something, um, that's uh, more similar, if possible, to mm-hmm. what has been in the past. Yeah, um, and then um, and then w- we're with the um, reservations stuff like that. Um, how are we doing the reservations? Um, do the cost, all that kind of stuff too. Mm-hmm. So on? reservations are all online, and there's a link on our website for that. And each reservation so is a circle. It's not a person. So a reservation is a circle. And it's $25, and that's a donation that's going to go to Christmas House, um, which is through the Stanwood Camino Food Bank. And that all is going to go directly to um, children in the area for toys and clothes that they need during the winter time. So it's a great way to both reserve your spot so that we can estimate who's coming and also to give through the community as well. Very cool. 
Um, yeah, and, and we're going to have those tickets available. Um, they're actually on sale now. Um, the reservations are, and you can just go to kamenocommons.com slash events, um, and there's a link on that page to get your reservation. Um, the sooner the better. That way we're not um, – that way we make sure that we have – we can accommodate everyone. Um, and, of course, if we run out of reservations and stuff, we will have the Facebook Live available for people to watch. Um, yeah, and then um, – we're just starting this, like getting all going, but kind of just what is our, with the wine, this is changing a little bit, but just what are we doing with wine and, and where are we going with it? Yeah. So we are starting out with, um, bottles, um, bottle sales, and we are really looking at Washington wine and we're looking to continue the goal of organic and biodynamic wine as much as we can, um, so that we are meeting that, um, that, uh, how do I say the goal, I suppose that we've set through the coffee roasters next door that we're also, um, the coffee that we're selling. And, um, we want to make sure that we're uh, supporting our local wineries and vineyards and also doing the best that we can. So, um, starting from that, we are going to have a variety of wineries, um, represented and a variety of wines. Um, they'll probably rotate through as we go. Um, we'll see kind of what, what you all, the community are interested in, um, and go from there. So we'll start with that. Um, and we're hoping to also be able to offer wine tastings, um, of what we have available and maybe expand even to events that would include that, um, and potentially tasting nights with some of the, the people that are actually making the wine for you. Um, if that's possible, we would love to be able to do that too. So, yeah. Very cool. Um, all right. Well, I like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. So the first one is, um, what purchase of a hundred dollars or less have you enjoyed the most in the last three months? Um, oh, the last three months. Okay. Uh, probably, oh, I bought a book that I'm really excited about, but it doesn't come out until February. So I did the pre-sale option. So I bought it technically in the last three months, but I haven't experienced it, but I'm very excited to experience it. <laughs> So I think that qualifies. <laughs> what, what book is this? It's called From Streams to the Ocean. Um, and it's the second book by this author, Jedediah Jenkins. And read the first book and um, was fascinated by it. It was a travel book. He um, rode his bicycle um, all the way through Central and South America. And it's just sort of his journey. Um, and so this one is a little bit different, it sounds like. Um, but still along some of the th same themes. Um, and that was one of my first books I read during... During uh, quarantine, I had sort of like a quarantine reading list, um, and that was at the beginning. So I'm excited to to see this new one. So. Nice. All right. <clears throat> Pretend you have a friend coming from out of town. What would the first day look like here? Oh, um, I would drive out to Deception Pass and go on a hike. Absolutely. Um, and there would definitely be coffee involved um, some way or another, either stopping somewhere in downtown Mount Vernon on the way out there, since I live in Mount Vernon, or we might make a little detour um, out to the marketplace and get coffee and then head over that direction. Nice. All right. Who is an interesting or fascinating person in this community that I should interview next? Ooh. Um... It's a tie between two people. I would say either Brittany Erickson, because she is super fascinating and people just need to get more to know about her. Um, and she has a lot of delightful stories that I'm sure that you could tap into. Um, or uh, this is just my personal preference. Um, my dad, I think he's quite an interesting person. And he's been living in this community for... Oh, gosh, um, 22 years. Um, and he was a state park ranger and has a lot of interesting stories and insights. Very cool. Um, I've heard Brittany's pretty fascinating. So, Yeah, I've heard that too. <laughs> All right. And lastly, if you could have a message on a billboard right on Camino Island as you're driving on, what would that say? Oh, look outside your windows. It's so beautiful. There's so many things to see. And just stop when you want to stop. It's gorgeous. Very cool. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thank you for having me. It's been delightful. All right. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Emily for joining me on the podcast today. And thank you for listening. 
If you haven't already, be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It really helps us be found by other islanders like yourself. And for more information on this episode, you can go to kaminocommons.com slash EP70. That's kaminocommons.com slash EP70. Thanks for listening and see you next time.